Welcome to the inclusive master schedule, a window into the soul of the school featuring McMicken Elementary. We are joined today by, we have uh, Alex Haas, Principal McMicken Elementary, Jody Robertson, Assistant Principal, and from the Demo UW Demonstration Sites team, myself, Rena Marie Leon Guerrero, joined by Christina Novak and Molly Lyman. We're excited to share how inclusive master schedules are a window into the soul of the school and hear firsthand how this is evident at McMicken Elementary. In today's session, we will describe the critical elements of an inclusive master schedule, understand how tier one supports and collaborative structures in a master schedule has positive impacts on student outcomes and describe a process for building an inclusive master schedule, including strategies and steps to engage diverse partners. First, let's start with a little background information about the Inclusionary Practices Project. In a statewide effort to improve inclusionary practices across Washington State, after Washington rated 45th, uh, 44th out of 50 of the least inclusive states based on LRE data. In the fall of 2019, OSPI launched the Inclusionary Practices Professional Development Project. Um, please see the code um, or link for more information on the IPP. As part of the IPP, the University of Washington Herring Center partnered with OSPI to coordinate and lead this part of the larger statewide project, creating model demonstration sites that highlight inclusionary practices across Washington State. The demonstration sites project was developed to provide educators from around the state with the opportunity to observe inclusionary practices in action, meet with school teams, collect artifacts that aid in systems change, and learn about how to implement inclusionary practices in different school contexts. In collaboration with the Herring Center Inclusion Specialists, demonstration sites host visiting schools to so showcase high leverage inclusionary practices. By sharing these practices and opening their doors to teachers, administrators, families, and community members, it allows visitors to see best practices in action and apply them in their schools. At the same time, the demonstration sites themselves continue to grow their inclusive cultures and refine their practices that contribute to equitable learning for all students. There are some founding principles that drive our model demonstration sites work. First, we recognize that inclusive education is a cultural shift, not a special education initiative. We have a responsibility and a role to play in dismantling the barriers to creating inclusive school cultures and ensuring that each student across our district is a valued member of the community. To do this, we engage our demonstration sites and districts in an asset-based approach to organizational and systems change. We know that in every school, there are things that are working well, and an asset-based approach is a way for schools to leverage their strengths to become more inclusive. More specifically, we recognize that implementing inclusive practices in isolation is not enough. And so we support our schools to leverage their strengths to engage in building inclusive school cultures that change across the systems of which they are a part. Whether it is through our webinars, school visits, virtual visits, or networking events, sharing our demonstration site's journey towards inclusive education is a crucial aspect for how we provide transformational learning experiences for our visitors, across the state who want to share um, their own ed inclusive education journeys. Our demonstration sites are each um, at various stages in this work. And whether the, in they're in year three or year six, they're each engaged in cycles of continuous improvement to move their work forward. This requires a commitment to collaboration and diverse contributions to strengthen outcomes for all students, as well as innovative site-based and district leadership across the system. And it's really special to have um, time with McMicken Elementary today because they, they really are the, the site that began this whole project and we're the original kind of lab school that started the vision of the demonstration site. So as you, you will hear, they'll share a little later how they're farther along in their journey. But as a demonstration site, all our sites engage in continuous growth improvement by building, as Christina talked about, those professional networks sharing their journey and their next steps along the way and engaging in ongoing reflection and action. And then districts learn from the sites by understanding the, the ways that barriers were recognized and removed across the demonstration sites journey 
applying lessons to create systematic change throughout the district and connect with districts across the state to share lessons and engage in ongoing growth and transformation statewide. And to date, we are in this spring and to date, McMicken has hosted 80 visitors to come and open their doors to 80 visitors to come and see and learn from, from their school and their community. So 80 years of research in our field that tells us that inclusion is better for everyone. And we also know that we have poor outcomes when students are educated in segregating settings. Schools reflect their mission and vision and dismantle segregated classrooms. And that is done with intentionality at McMicken. Uh, McCart and Miller's leading equity-based MTSS book stress creating a schedule as a function of the mission and vision, school priorities, centering students, those collaborative structures, and maximizing school resources. Next, now I would like to um, turn it over to the leadership at McMicken Elementary, and they will walk through and you'll um, hear firsthand as they share building their master schedule, the strong foundations in MTSS and tier one, um, their co-teaching model, and, um, and they, as they begin to explore and talk about access to general education curriculum. Thank you, Rita Marie. Um, so at McMicken, we truly believe that everyone um, can dream it, believe it, achieve it, and exceed it. And we share this message with our students day in, day out. Um, we have been on this journey for many years, and um, we really are striving every year to take one or two or three or 10 steps forward. Um, but I want to acknowledge that it has been incremental. And I think what's so important is to um, have an assessment of where you are and some really great, powerful, high leverage next steps, and then try on some things that seem promising, continue to refine and keep growing. And so this is a graphic that uh, kind of highlights some key elements of our journey. And so in our program here at McMicken, um, we are at the point where we do have several programming options um, for students with special needs. And I know that there's different names for the different kind of programming, um, but we have uh, an emotional behavioral center program. Uh, we have a learning or what's usually used as called a resource room. We call it a learning resource center uh, programming. Um, we also have um, some other options such as an integrated kindergarten and then recently uh, integrated learning center, which in our um, neighborhood and our students feeding in typically support students with adaptive cognitive and aut in um, different um, autism related needs um, and so you can see that uh, when we started our process on our inclusive journey one of our very first things we needed to do was to go to the basic programming of our learning resource center students and see that um, we were pulling them out during core and they were missing crucial opportunities for deliberate practice. And there was little to no collaboration around um, supporting students between the special education, uh, specially designed instruction providers and the general education teachers. And so one of the ways we uh, rectified that was by launching what we call our success groups, which is basically our RCI model. And at that point, now we had a place where students could receive a double dose and that's where students who, no matter what their need was, whether it was repeated deliberate practice, whether it was specially designed instruction or whether it was extension, every student got their needs met in success group. And students who had learning resource center um, needs could um, be seen in small groups as everybody else. And they weren't pulled out on their own during core. As we decided to figure out how to expand this vision further, uh, our team looked at some co-teaching practice um, and did a pilot in 2016-17, and this was primarily for our Learning Resource Center students, and um, saw such promise in that practice that we scaled it um, to triple the size the following year. And at that point, our Emotional Behavioral Center staff which is in our, in our district and historically has traditionally been self-contained, um, decided to uh, try co-teaching as well. And so again, 
beginning to open the doors, bust down the barriers between the program. As we continue to see that promise in co-teaching, we really expanded it, as you can see, um, through 2017 and 18. And then when we got to 2019, we really recognized that we had a lot of students who were coming into our school that we unfortunately had, we didn't even have a chance to meet because we didn't have programming to support them. And I use the term programming versus a program um, because the idea of course is that as much of their uh, students' needs are met are in the general education classroom. So in this case, we launched our first integrated kindergarten program and wherein we were able to um, serve more students from our neighborhood population. And so uh, as we went, um, you know, into that year, we had a really robust co-teaching practice. We had onboarded an integrated kindergarten program. Um, and we were in really great shape to really expand our inclusion programming. Uh, when the pandemic hit 2020, 21, uh, we decided to go ahead to, and um, continue those, those strong practices best we could in a virtual setting. And what was kind of exciting was um, previous to 2020, um, we had strong co-teaching practice for our emotional behavioral center uh, uh, staff and, and students. And um, what they found when during virtual instruction is that there was no need to do really any version of pull out or really have any kind of self-contained programming. Um, and so when we came back in 2021 fully in person, uh, we decided we wanted to uh, remove that barrier entire, entirely. And so at this point, we decided to fully dismantle that self-contained programming for students identifying as needing emotional behavioral center needs. And so we um, have over the, the last couple of years really tried to look across all of our case managers, whether you're working with students in kindergarten and an integrated kindergarten, whether you're supporting students have emotional behavioral needs or you're supporting students a learning resource center, ultimately uh, it's about expertise and sharing staff and maximizing staff. And so this year we've been really excited because our goal is to ultimately be able to serve everyone who walks in that door. So we knew we needed some additional expertise around students with, um, with some higher level need in, in the area of uh, cognitive, adaptive, and um, autism. And so we were able to hire staffing to support that. And now we're working to basically develop almost a menu of services that will support all students in our neighborhood uh, reference area. Uh, so some things to consider when you're developing a master schedule that helps to support this um, strong collaboration, flexible delivery service, uh, strong collaboration between general education and special education. Um, there are some things that you need to um, keep in mind. Um, and so, so you can know what uh, kind of some of the metrics that we're working with and see how it might compare to your personal situation. Uh, we have around 500 students. It fluctuates a little bit up or down. You can see we have a high percentage, a significant percentage of students identifying as multilingual learners. Um, we are right around the state average for learners qualifying for special education services for the state of Washington. Um, and you can see we also do serve students qualifying for McKinney Vinto. Our staffing model is no different than any other um, staffing in, in our district with our students identified with needs per their IEP. So we don't have any additional staffing. We just, we have the same contractual guidelines. We follow the same contractual guidelines as any other uh, school in the Highline Public Schools. And so you can kind of see per, per caseload, uh, you know, we do have quite a few case managers, uh, but that really is reflected. That would be the same no matter what building you're in if you're working with these program, programmatic needs. And then you can see um, our allocation of paraeducators. Um, we do get funded through our special education. Uh, services, but we also um, intentionally allocate 
paraeducator funding through our categorical budgets as well. And we will often um, mix and match some of those funding sources to just make sure students get the support that they need. And when you are developing your master's schedule, obviously you want to make sure that you have uh, your big picture goals in mind. Um, we often start thinking about our student needs first that drive everything. And so around this time of year, we start thinking about where are our students who have the highest level of need? What does the need look like? What is the kind of services that need to be provided? And where are they um, living? Are they mostly clustered in a couple of grade levels? Um, are they spread across multiple grade levels? Um, it's different every year. Um, and so we kind of start looking at where, where those needs are and the distribution of students to start looking at um, aligning our staffing uh, priorities, finding um, pockets that could support co-teaching partnerships, for example. And then of course we go into looking at our current master schedule and constantly in a place of reflection and making sure that, um, you know, one example that Jody will share in more detail is an iter a recent iteration is, is asking our entire staff to have consistent content blocks so that um, related service providers and case managers can more easily um, collaborate with general education staff. And so that would be an example of something that you would consider as you move into the development of your master schedule to make it truly inclusive. And so kind of big picture uh, with the process before um, uh, Jody goes into more detail is uh, starting with our inclusive educators. And I think when, when we talk with teams who come to visit us, um, that sometimes seems like the very first step to take is to involve your inclusive educators as they're, or as we call them now, case managers, first at the table. Um, oftentimes it will be specialists like uh, music or PE, for example, that, that come to the table first. And that their voice is very important. But if you want to have a truly inclusive master schedule, you have to center not only the students, as I mentioned in the previous slide, but the case managers as well, so that you can set up a schedule that puts the most emphasis on supporting students um, furthest away from educational justice. And so at this point, um, Jody will share a little more detail about how that um, is implemented. All right, so here's an example of a master schedule from last year. And a couple of things to point out is um, the yellow blocks at the bookends of our, of our student day. Um, in the morning, we start every classroom starts with a morning meeting. During this morning meeting structure, um, we do follow the responsive classroom and we'll talk a little bit more about the components of that in a minute, but this is a great time for teachers and students to engage in cell lessons to um, really build that sense of belonging within their classroom and also to provide some opportunities for that instruction on race and identity. So that is how every one of our students starts their day. And then, um, like Alex mentioned uh, a couple years ago, when we really just decide to dismantle our EVC programs, I was reflecting with one of our EVC case managers, and he was sharing how um, his students really need a choice time built into their schedule. And I'm like, well, if your students need it, I'm pretty sure all of our students need it. And so what we did is we used to have about 30 minutes for morning meeting. We condensed that time, and then we added a, um, because we're the McMakin Cougars, we added a Cougar time or a choice time at the end of the day. And that really is an opportunity for students to look forward to, to really connect with their peers. And it's also earned. And so they have to be able to complete their work throughout the day. They have to be able to have, you know, positive interactions with peers throughout the day. And, you know, and if they do, fail to, you know, complete their writing assignment, that's a great time for them to finish that. Or if there is conflict out at recess or in the lunchroom, that's a great time to do that conflict resolution. So um, last year was when we really did shift our time to include that um, cougar time for all of our students. 
Um, this master schedule also shows that we prioritize common planning time for all of our grade levels. And you can see that in the um, orange, the kind of darker yellow, lighter orange color with the specialist block. That is one of our high leverage strategies is in order to really support inclusion, we have to have strong tier one instruction. And that happens when we have general education teachers around the table collaboratively planning and building those really strong unit plans. Our goal has always been to get our case managers or our special education teachers to join. That continues to be a challenge, but we have some ideas moving forward and how we wanna do that. Um, we do try and free up as much of their time as possible so they can join those PLCs um, when it's feasible. Um, the other thing that you'll see on this master schedule is those success groups that Alex was talking about earlier. That is when um, students are getting their FDI, when students are getting intervention, and also enrichment if they're at or above grade level. So it's it's a really inclusive um, opportunity. And when Alex mentioned that um, we build the master schedule based off of student needs, you'll see in this example, second and third grade have success groups together. That's based off of student numbers. And so every year it's a bit different, really matching what our students need. If you go to the um, next slide, it will be our Friday schedule. Our district does have early release Friday. So we have um, professional collaboration time for 90 minutes at the end of the day. So you'll see on Fridays, we prioritize a longer morning meeting so that they have that, that full 30 minutes to really devote to sell or seed. Um, same things apply on, on a Friday schedule. We have common planning time, and we do not, however, have success groups. Our case managers, that's when they are pulling students um, with um, minute IEP minutes for those um, social emotional groups. Um, next slide, you'll see our current master schedule. A lot of the same components. Again, every year it looks a bit different because every year we're seeking feedback from our case managers, from our students, and from our general education teachers. Um, so similar things from the previous year, we have that morning meeting in the morning and then our um, cougar time at the end of the day, we still are prioritizing common planning time. The shift that we made going from last year to this year was in reflecting with our case managers, like Alex mentioned, they really wanted to have common um, content blocks because a lot of our case managers support grade bands. They wanted, if they needed to pull a group or be able to push in for core support, they wanted to have um, the grade levels doing ELA at the same time or math at the same time. So that is a shift that we made um, this year. So similar things, common planning time, reading success groups, math success groups, um, and then you'll see all those content blocks. If you go to the next slide is an example of Friday. Same, same thing as previous years, we prioritize a longer morning meeting on Fridays to give that little bit of extra time to close up the week with uh, some strong cell instruction. So one of the things that we are um, really trying to support with our schedule is strong tier one, um, tier two and tier three as needed. And so for example, I mentioned the core instruction, aligning our instructional blocks. Um, the success groups we mentioned as well um, would be a double dose or our tier two instruction. And then if we need to have additional supports uh, that there's offer opportunities and breathing room in that schedule as well. Um, as you heard Jody talking about, for example, the choice time, which is really critical for our students um, who are working on social emotional skills and that's across the board obviously um, but if we do have students who need additional choice time then that can be built into our schedule as well so it's really important to have within your schedule that flexibility along um, all of these um, tiers to best meet student needs Uh, so we mentioned the concept of success groups uh, to give you a little more information about how that works. Uh, they, we do have a block for reading slash literacy and also for math. Uh, students who are receiving specially di designed instruction in that, in either of those goal areas per, uh, per their IEP, uh, will not necessarily be pulled during core in order to get that. Um, they will receive their instruction as a double dose. Uh, students 
receiving um, needs for enrichment or intervention are um, all students, no matter what delineation, um, whether, you know, with an IEP or without an IEP. Um, we have students who qualify for language learning support, and that's a great opportunity for them to get um, a double dose as well. And then what um, makes our success groups perhaps a little more intentionally inclusive is we're looking at case managers uh, sharing students across caseloads. Um, so uh, we might have a, a case manager who is uh, assigned to our emotional behavioral program, but they have two or three students who might have learning resource center uh, SDI needs and a couple of general education students who have maybe no IEP who have a same level of need based on their uh, data, which we'll get into the data in a minute. Um, and the other piece of it is general education teachers can share across their classrooms. So for example, you might see um, across four second grade classrooms sharing expertise and students uh, who need, uh, for example, maybe some foundational skills. Uh, they have one teacher supporting those students and then they have students who might need enrichment having other students supported uh, in another classroom. Uh, we do typically put our, our strategic level and um, meeting benchmark and above with our uh, paraeducators who can also support students from multiple classrooms. We do try to reserve the support of students with more intensive needs for our certificated staff within this model. And just to clarify, it's not a full walk to at all, but we do allow for that flexibility across grade levels and across programs. All right, so how do we determine um, what students are doing doing during those success groups is through our data analysis protocol or the DAP. Um, this is um, six to eight week data cycles and um, it alternates between formative or those iReady diagnostics and or summative assessments. Um, our teachers are using district tools to um, sorry, district tools through curriculum exit tickets. They're looking at um, unit planning, data they're collecting from their conferring groups. And they're really collecting all this data and they come together three or four times a year to determine who is showing proficiency and what growth students are making. They, we always start with celebrations. What is going well and why is it going well? That is that we really have an asset-based lens. What are the teacher practices that are contributing to the growth and the mastery of the standards that are being taught? Um, through this process, after they identify the strengths, then our teams really start to plot out where students fall, and then they plan a six to eight week intervention or enrichment cycle for those students. This is when they determine what are the specific skills students need to work on, who is going to be working with those students, what materials they will be using, and how often they'll be meeting. One of the big shifts in success groups um, that we did is making sure that our students furthest from educational justice are working with certificated or those general education teachers or case managers. Um, and then our paraeducators are working with the students who are receiving um, enrichment opportunities. This DAP process also um, informs our MTSS structure where we are really always monitoring and watching for students who aren't making as much growth as they could be. And we use this DAP cycle to really look at that intervention plan and make tweaks if necessary. Here are some examples of our DAP. Like I said, um, step one is plot your students. And this is across the whole grade level. So there really is, I don't like the term ownership anymore, but there really is co-ownership of all students at the grade level. We're all responsible for each other since we are doing that collaborative planning and we share the unit planning process. So we plot where students are. And then step two is we really look at those bright spots. And then we dive into where the areas of improvement are. Um, and then you can see at the bottom is where the intervention plan is, the who, the what, the how, and the when. And we wanna make sure that our students at the intensive or strategic level are being met with most frequently.
And one of the things we really try to normalize here at McMicken, and this has been over the last couple of years in particular, is just the concept of learning being challenging for everyone. Um, because when you have um, an individualized education plan, um, you know, if, if it has taken you a while to get that level of support, or if you, if you feel like you're, you know, often requiring a high level of support, it can sometimes lead to frustration. And then that can lead to some, um, you know, exiting from the learning process. And so we really want to say to all students, learning's hard. And really the most important things that you're going to learn are going to be more challenging. Um, if it was easy for you, you probably knew it in the first place. Um, and so for, for some of our principles that, again, kind of overlay our culture, uh, we have been really trying to teach into something that is called the learning pit, adapted from James, James Nottingham and also based on the work of James Hattie, who if you're familiar with his work studied effect sizes, uh, meta, meta studies around different practices that, that impact student growth. Um, and so the concept of the learning pit is the, the idea that, um, you know, as you are learning challenging material or learning something new, uh, you may experience a range of uh, emotions and thoughts around the, the challenge of the, of the problem and that you can use learner habits um, and learner dispositions to tackle those challenges. So at McMicken, we have identified our learner habits uh, as ways for students to go into and out of the learner pit. Uh, so you can see our, our, our cougars are taught to be collaborative, optimistic, understanding, growing, aware, and resilient. And so what do you do if you're in the learning pit? Well, you might work with a friend or a peer that might help you use being collaborative, or you might need to grow in your um, understanding of the concept. So that means you're growing, or you might need to be resilient and try again and again. So those would all be examples of strategies that we teach students no matter delineation of program or need to be getting in and out of the learner pit. And to that, you know, uh, I mentioned visible learning, that is a really key component of strong tier one um, that exists within that um, master schedule and across the building. Uh, so we have over the years studied uh, teacher clarity, which does have the capacity to double the rate of student learning within a school year. So uh, practices related to that include very strong learning targets, clear learning or clear success criteria, use of learning progressions, and really helping students know where they are, where they're going, how to get there and where to next. Um, I mentioned the learner learning pit normalizing challenge in learning and then also making sure that we're embedding all of this all these opportunities uh, with professional development opportunities for our staff um, recently we've really been um, reflecting on universal design for learning and how this strong foundation can then feed into really um, strengthening universal design for learning principles uh, as we plan our units. So when we were talking about master schedule, I mentioned that the bookends to our day, which is really um, our cell. And even a few years ago, we made the shift from just cell to seed because um, our, our goal at school is to, to be learning, right? To be teaching. So uh, Stella is in service of academic development. So morning meeting, again, we're using the responsive classroom um, framework. It really does build classroom community. It um, proactively supports in future conflicts that might arise. It, the goal is 30 minutes a day, but like I share, shared when we shifted to add that cougar time at the end of the day, we did condense that time. Um, and our, our goal is that across the four days, Monday through Thursday, our teachers are doing uh, one or two components of the morning meeting, which is uh, a morning message, a greeting, a share between students, and then some sort of group activity. And those group activities can be connected towards um, academics. So they can be really tailored to what students are going to be um, engaged in during core instruction. This is done K-5 and it is done daily. And then cougar time, like I mentioned before, really is that opportunity to um, have 
students engage in those cell skills, those foundations in a holistic way, it is earn time. It's a time for students to be accountable for their learning and for their choices. Um, it's also an opportunity for teachers to teach in. If you see that your, you know, your whole class is really struggling with this, you might just teach a lesson at that time. Um, like I shared, it's about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of each day. And teachers really have choice in how they do that. I know in a lot of our classrooms, um, part of the morning meeting structure is they get to choose what activity they're going to be working for um, during that cougar time. That way they know that if they um, make you know, positive choices, have a safe body, and um, engage in learning throughout the day that they can earn some Lego time or uh, directed drawing time or so it's it's a lot of choice and it's developmentally appropriate. The, the kindergartners are doing different things than the fifth graders are doing during their, their, their choice time. The other strong tier one practice that we have and every single one of our visitors that comes into our building compliments on this um, is our strong tier one practice. At McMicken, we are safe, we are responsible, and then we are the cougar. And cougar stands for those cougar habits that Alex was talking about before. We, um, we incentivize those habits. And so we do have cougar tickets. The blue ones are for individuals. Um, we pass them out. In fact, I have them right here. They're always being handed out. And then the green ones are for the community. We really want students to be working together as a community. So there's two separate cougar tickets. However, classes are collecting them together to um, work towards some sort of incentive or a class party. And so you can see examples on the screen of how um, teachers are tracking this progress in their classrooms. And then we recognize our all-star cougar at the end of each week. We launch the week with a video from Alex and myself launching our weekly habit. Um, an example of that could be, we are gonna advocate for our needs or we are going to celebrate success all around us and the teachers and students watch and then they identify an all-star cougar from each class. We announce those at the end of each week. They get a little prize, they get recognition in the classroom, um, they get recognized at our monthly assemblies. The other piece of our strong um, tier one PBIS cell structures is every classroom has a pause place, a pause center. That is a place where students can be asked or elect individually to go take a break, to calm down, to reset. We um, equip each of those centers with different resources like the mood meter, like the meta moment with some different fidgets, some different reflection tools. And so that is um, evident in every one of our um, spaces throughout the building. Thank you so much to Alex and Jody for similar to hosting visits um, in person, sharing this information um, virtually help support others wherever they might be on their inclusive journey and take um, and learn from this into their own um, context. And I just think about when we think draw from larger systems change and organization change, I have to think of a, a quote from W. Edwards Deming that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And I think we see that here with the McMickens master schedule where they really do get to see a window into the solo school, how they are prioritizing um, their um, clear mission and vision, centering students and um, yeah, and then and then we have this, um, as Jody was talking about, just that collective efficacy too. And um, and this is what we know this works well um, for students, but we all see associate at McMick and then it's working well for um, their their whole community too. And as we, um, yes, thank you everybody. As we are building our professional networks, there are contacts there. And also you can visit our IPP demonstration sites page, there's a link there. The QR code was earlier in the presentation. And then on our last slide is artifacts that are also available at the website. Yeah, thank you everyone.